Hey everybody, welcome back to Art by Galen. My name is Galen Eilenfeld. I'm the creator, writer, and artist behind my series Baku Dreamwalkers, and welcome back to my series Creating Comics Start to Finish. Today we're going to be talking about making comic book covers. And one thing I want to point out real quick before we even get started, this is not going to be an art tutorial. This isn't necessarily something that's going to give you style guides or how to draw your covers or anything like that. These are going to be pointers and tips, do's and don'ts, that sort of thing. Things to think about when you're creating your covers to make sure that you make as effective a cover as possible. Now before I start getting into the tips for creating your comic book covers, let me know in the comments, do you have some favorite or maybe least favorite comic book covers uh, that really stand out to you? Like do you have one that stands out that is maybe the best cover you've ever seen, the most effective one you've ever seen, or maybe the worst, like what is the, the worst example of an effective comic book cover that you've ever seen? Um, let me know down in the comments because I'd, I'd love to take a look at them. When you're working on your comic, some of these things will probably seem pretty obvious, but I mean, they are good to keep in mind when you're creating the covers for your book. Probably the biggest thing is it needs to be attention grabbing. And there's a lot of ways that you can make a comic cover grab the attention of a potential reader from the shelf or from a series of different comics and things like that that are on crowdfunding sites. One of the ways that you can make sure that it's attention grabbing is to have a clear focal point. Don't make it too cluttered. Don't have a whole bunch going on in the, in the cover and pay attention to your composition. You know, your, your layout of the page is going to be very important. And let me know if you want me to do a whole video covering composition for comic covers, because that could be a whole thing on its own. You know, a lot of times with the focal points, it's going to be one of the main characters. I'm going to use my books as examples, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that my covers are fantastic, but I do try to make them effective. The focal point here is the main character, Penelope. She's sitting on the curb of a street with her skateboard. You can see some city lights and stuff in the background. And I've it really increased the contrast to where she pops out a lot more by blurring the backgrounds out and making her 100% the focal point of the cover. When you've decided on what's going to be your focal point and your overall composition, something else to keep in mind is it should be easy to read, uh, and that is easy to see and understand the image from close up or from very far away. You know, even from way back here, you can tell that it seems to be a character you know, sitting on a street corner or something like that because you can see the city lights in the background. And you may not be able to see the skateboard, but you can definitely see the pose that she's in. And that's what I mean, like you want it to be identifiable, whether it's close up or far away. Uh, that way people can see it from a distance uh, if they're perusing a bookshelf or a crowdfunding site or something like that. Some other things to keep in mind is you, you want to make sure that your cover represents the tone or the vibe of the book as well as the contents of that particular issue. You don't want your covers to display something happening that doesn't actually happen in the story or in that issue. Uh, you're probably going to annoy your readers that way. Uh, just a real quick example. These are the original covers I did for Baku 1 and 2. Uh, number 1 just shows Penelope upside down in kind of a dream state. We have some crazy textures and you know energy effects going on. Just kind of introducing people to the thought of mind energy and and you know dreaming energy number two admittedly this is probably my weakest cover uh, in my opinion because i feel like i was a little bit lazy with how i chose to just do a zoomed in face i didn't do a lot of detail um you know showing a body or a scene or anything like that but it does make sense because in issue two i introduced this new character called the dream emissary and I did want her to be on the cover. So those are the original covers for one and two. When I when I ran out of copies of those for sale, I did new covers for issue one and for issue two. Uh, issue one showing a little bit more of Penelope and a little bit more of her personality, like that she's a skateboarder, that she likes to kind of hang out alone, and she's not afraid to be in the city at night and stuff like that. And issue two, we zoom out and we see a little bit more of the dream emissary and kind of bursting into the scene. Um, it's still simple but it is effective. And then for issue three, my main cover that I did, we're introducing a, another new character named Faith, and we see her kind of generating imagery with her hands, and we're not exactly sure what's going on, but later on in the issue, this does actually happen. So what I'm saying is like, I, I try to be mindful of what's happening in the issue, or if there's a new character being introduced, or if there's a particular, you know, fight that happens or something like that. You might want to display something that, that, kind of hints toward that or full on reveals it on the cover and draws people in and gets their interest. Another thing is, you know, pay attention to what kind of covers are popular right now. Like go take a look at your store shelves, like your local comic book store and see what kinds of covers seem to be like really popular. You'll notice that a lot of them 
have similar styles and vibes, especially like what happens sometimes is like the smaller publishers or even the bigger publishers. If there's a really popular book, you'll notice that there's a slew of books that kind of emulate that style or vibe or genre. Rather than emulating that, do something completely opposite. Do something in, you know, a different color scheme or a different compositional style, you know, a different focal point, a different zoom or something like that to make your book stand out that much more from what is flooding the shelves at the moment. A couple of other simple points is, you know, keep your audience in mind. You need to know, you know, what your target audience is and you need to know what they're expecting from your book and you want to accurately represent that. You don't want to have something on the cover that isn't representative of what your comic is or is about. And if you're not entirely sure about all of this, like you can always ask other creators or comic readers for input uh, and what they think about your potential covers or existing covers and things like that. I do think you have to be kind of careful when you're asking for input because you do want to stick to your own ideas, but you need to be open and be able to to hear input from other people. It's just that that fine line of determining what input is going to be valuable for you and what input is not. One of the things that I do when I get input from people is I try to filter out things that are opinion versus things that have like logic and reasoning behind them. Like if somebody says, well, I just don't like the positioning of this and they can't explain why, I'm not as likely to listen to that advice as if they were to say, well, I don't like the composition of this because it pushes the character too far off the side of the scene or it should have had this happening or this you know, you showed this on the cover and then it never actually happened in the book. Those are things that they can back up with either fact or logic. And I'm far more likely to listen to input like that than I am things that are just opinions. A couple of bonus things, and, and I may throw some, some examples of some not so great covers up here. I'm not trying to shame anybody. We've all done bad art before it happens. It's just, uh, it's unfortunate that some of us who have done bad art have also published it. So, <laughs> but, but it happens. Number one, don't hide feet and don't hide hands. Don't, just don't. Um, I understand that hands and feet are difficult to draw. It's worth taking the time to do it. Find references, draw the damn thing, and, you know, figure out some way to do it. Okay, this is my cover, and you see my arms all the way off here like this. You know, the, it just wouldn't really make any sense. Like, something like this is going to be far more effective, right? Another thing is that readers will often like it much more if the art style of the cover matches what's inside the book. It can be really jarring uh, to see like a really spectacular looking cover and then open it up to subpar or mediocre artwork or artwork in a completely different style. Not everybody cares about this, but the, I know a lot of people do. And to me, like it's, it's worth considering and it makes sense that you want things to be consistent. Like I, I personally, as a reader, when I buy a comic, if I open, if I have a cover that I think is fantastic and I open it up and the, the artwork is underwhelming in comparison, it's, it's kind of jarring and I'm less likely to continue buying that series. Now I understand like covers can have more detail and things like that. That's fine. You can have more detail. You can have like more color development, that kind of thing. But the style of the artwork needs to be similar. Another thing when you're doing your covers, make sure you leave room for your logo. You don't want your logo to be covering up details like the face or something important. And if you're the one designing your logo for your book, make sure that it makes sense for the type of book that you're making. It either needs to fit the genre or the style or the vibe or something. It needs to make sense. Like you don't want to have a really cutesy bubbly logo with, you know, for instance, something like a Frank Miller book or something like that. You know, it, it, it needs to fit. One more thing that I am going to point out, like, because I am a creator who does uh, 18 plus content in my comics, I see absolutely nothing wrong with doing comics that have 18 plus content, whether that is, you know, violence or nudity or language or all of the above. I don't see any problem with having those, but I do think if you are going to create those kinds of things, you need to let your readers know that that's going to be in the books. You can do it very like boldly by putting a big, you know, 18 plus only sticker or something like that on it. Some people do that kind of stuff for extra attention. Um, personally, me, I keep it very simple. I have a little warning up here under the issue number that says intended for mature readers, you know, because this series doesn't go really overboard with like nudity, violence or language, but it does have a little bit of all of that. It's it's not at the forefront of the story or anything, so it's not excessive. It's not even in every issue. 
but it does happen from time to time because it is a more mature story. If I were making a book that is definitely more adult themed, I would more than likely make the warning a little bit more noticeable because you don't want to you don't want to jar your readers. You you know, you want to let them know what they're getting into. You don't want them to open up the book or get to a specific page and then just be shocked at what they're seeing or reading uh, in a bad way. And uh, so before we wrap up, like we can't really talk about comic covers without talking about variant covers. And I, I'm, I'm going to touch on this quickly. I've, I've done some variants myself. My most recent issue, number three, it had three variant covers done by different artists. Well, one, one was done by myself and two were other artists that I had hired to do covers. Um, I followed the same kind of rules. You know, it, they still demonstrate what's happening in the book or, you know, introducing new characters or something like that. But I allowed the artists complete freedom to do things in their own style. That is one of the areas where I think you can kind of break the rules as far as the art matching the inside of the book. Because if it is a variant, it's a, it's a chance to be more expressive with the work. You know, some of the pros of doing variants, obviously, you know, being more expressive... It increases collectability because it, it creates multiple versions of things, you know, and, and if you find uh, readers who are also collectors, you know, they may want to get, you know, multiple copies of the books and things like that, which, uh, you know, generates extra revenue for the creators, obviously. And it creates a sort of marketing and buzz because you have potential for different styles and different ways of speaking about your book visually that might draw in new readers. But there are some cons to doing variants. Um, you know, it can be confusing for readers and collectors, especially if you get into having really high numbers of variants. Personally, I have the mindset of if you pass five, you might want to tone it down a bit. <laughs> uh, that's just my own personal preference. I don't like going beyond that number. For instance, with issue three, I had my cover plus the three variants plus I had a sketch cover done. So total, that's five. And I felt like that was more than enough. I've seen a number of crowdfunding campaigns where they might have 10 or even 20 and 25 plus variant covers available for their book. And the book might only be, you know, 15, 20 pages or something like that. So it's like you've effectively paid, you know, far more for artwork than you have for the development of the book itself. And that's one of the cons as well, is I, I feel like sometimes the overall quality of the book can suffer when you spend too much of your resources on creating variants instead of developing the book itself. I think the content of the book is far more important. That said, there are definitely people who collect just for covers and don't even read the books. Another con is it can create uh, sort of what they would call a fragmented market where you make it difficult for readers to find the specific cover that they want. Uh, because you're you're inevitably going to be doing lower counts of them if you're doing, you know, four or more different print runs of different covers and things like that. And so it might make it harder for them to acquire the one that they want. Um, and it, it honestly, it can be unfair to retailers, too, because multiple covers, it's going to put them in a hard spot. They're, you know, if they want to carry your book and if they want to carry each cover of your book, it forces them to increase their costs in order to carry your work. And sometimes they might just choose not to carry it at all rather than to only have a part of it. And so these are just things that you're going to need to think about when you're creating your comic covers and, you know, when you're talking about doing variant covers. One that I will always do is a sketch cover because I, and, and this is an actual pencil drawing. It's not printed on there. This is done on a harder cardstock. And then I do the cover behind that. And this way, people, you know, who are artists can get copies of these and they can draw their own cool collectible covers, either for themselves or to sell or whatever they want to do with them. So before we go, I do want to take a moment and thank our sponsor, and that's Comics Wellspring. And Comics Wellspring is a comic book and accessory printer for comic creators. They can do comic books and manga books of pretty much any size. They can do accessories and merch for your convention tables and things. If you have picked up any copies of my books, Bakker Dreamwalkers, or of the Creating Comics workbook that I made that goes along with this series, all of those were printed by Comics Wellspring. The quality is fantastic. The customer service is fantastic. And they work very closely with creators to help improve what they do for us. And that's one of the really big reasons that I love them as a company, because of how closely they do actually work with indie comic creators. While we're talking about comics wellspring and talking about my comics i also want to thank you if you have ever purchased any of my books baku dreamwalkers the creating comics workbook 
or my uh, my pinup book called Elucid. Uh, all of those were printed by Comics Wellspring. Thank you so much if you've picked those up and supported my work. That is how I try to pay my bills, is by selling my comics and selling my art, and as well as through my Patreon. And uh, a huge shout out and thank you to the names that you're going to see come across the screen here in just a second. Anyhow, I hope you have a fantastic day, and until next time, keep creating and take care.